Hello and welcome. Welcome, as always, to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Uh, my name is Pastor Chris Stark, and I have the opportunity to work with you uh, for the next few sessions for a uh, kind of an intro to the Bible. Now, this isn't anything comprehensive. This isn't anything that will cover even just uh, anything more than a sliver of, of what the Bible is and what it has been for folks uh, throughout history. But for the next four weeks, and actually we started this last week, so I would encourage you to take a look at last week's session so that you can uh, be more aware of, of what it is that uh, we are talking about and, you know, what Bible is right for you and how we approach the Bible. Uh, but I was trying to figure out what we could start with today. Uh, since last week, we talked a lot about uh, different translations and uh, different ways to approach scripture and what the nature of scripture is and what it means for us uh, as an authority for people of faith. Since we have talked about that, it's good that we read the Bible. Uh, now, what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks is take a portion of one section of scripture and take a look at it and um, have a conversation about that in some way that leads us to understand a little bit more about the text and how it has been approached uh, throughout history. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. So if you have a Bible with you, I invite you to, to grab one, uh, whatever translation it is, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, I, I did say that there are a couple of different ways that we can approach scripture, uh, either as a meditative um, device, something that will allow us to, to hear God speaking to us today, um, or as a study, and study is what we're going to do today. Now, we can approach it differently in, in the different sessions that we have. Uh, so if there is a particular passage in scripture that you'd like to know more about or that you have found tricky, let me know uh, in the comments. Uh, or, or like to let me know that what you're uh, seeing here is something that you can follow along with. Well, what better place can we start than in the beginning? Let's start at the very beginning of the Bible. We find, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read the first two chapters of the beginning scroll or uh, Genesis, as it is known. We'll talk a little bit about more why it's called Genesis uh, and what the nature of the first couple stories are. Uh, so I invite you to either grab your Bible and open up to Genesis, the very first uh, book in the Bible, or to follow along with me as I read it here. Now, this is the NR NRSV translation, New Revised Standard Version. Um, but again, you can follow along with whatever you like. This program that I'm using, the software, is uh, eSword. It's uh, a pretty great tool that is free to be able to uh, compare different translations and look at the Greek and the Hebrew alongside how we would read it in the English. But for now, let's read the English version of the New Revised Standard Version. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the, from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry, earth, the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on the earth that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. 
God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created, excuse me, oh, where'd we go? <laughs> so God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils breath of life. And the man became a living being and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed out of the ground. The Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Phishan. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of the land is good. Delam and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. And the one that flows around the whole land of Kush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you shall eat it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal and field, every bird of the air, and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to all the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not a found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to him. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So this is a reading of the first and second chapter of Genesis. You might wonder why it's called Genesis. Something fun that we can do with this software is I can go right over here to compare, and I can get uh, the first verse of Genesis 1 in every translation that I have available. I can look at it in the American Standard Version, Bible and Basic English, English Standard Version, the Greek, uh, 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 the Good News Bible, uh, Greek, Old Testament, the Hebrew uh, here. Um, and since it was written in Hebrew, that's probably the, the easiest way to look at it. What you notice here is the very first word, and we read it, uh, we read, we read Hebrew right to left rather than left to right like we would English. So the very first word that we find in, in the very first book of the Bible is Bereshit. Now what I can do with this software is I can click on that word and take a look at what it actually says. Bereshit, Rashid is first, beginning, chief. Um, now what we don't see here is any definite article. Uh, there is no uh, hey there, no hey that would uh, denote a the in English. So if you were translating this literally, it would actually come out as in a beginning, uh, which is interesting because in every single version of the English, we have in the beginning. Now, this is where some of our study would start to take effect, and it takes effect in the very first word of scripture. Uh, we, we are so used to in the beginning because we are used to this being the creation story. It's the way that we have been taught. It's the way we've been brought up that this is the way that the world came into being. Of course, uh, if you're looking at this and you're uh, looking at it without the lens of someone who was raised in scripture or who was brought in with the tradition of what uh, this story is about, it really is in a beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. But we run into another quick little problem here because there is a uh, disconnect in chapter two between verse three and verse four. So we have one cohesive narrative between Genesis one, chapter one, through Genesis two, chapter three, or Genesis chapter two, verse three. And we have uh, uh, another narrative uh, that begins Genesis chapter two, verse four. We actually have two creation stories. I hope this doesn't come as a shock to you, uh, but within the creation stories, there's actually two different accounts. And you can even see that they are different in makeup with the way that they name God. You'll see in the very first chapter and up in chapter two to verse three, uh, that the title for God, and this is something that we can do by looking at the Hebrew, uh, by looking at the word for God here, The word for God here is Elohim. Elohim is oh, a generic term for God. Uh, you see it used in Hebrew scriptures to refer to gods, and you also see it refer, uh, used in the Hebrew scriptures to refer to God Almighty, uh, God of uh, Jacob and Isaac and Joseph. Um, now we see in a change here, and in chapter two, after this this switch in narrative after verse four, it's no longer Elohim here. Instead, it's translated into English as Lord God. And when you look at that comparatively, you see that the word that they used for Lord God is the Yod He Vav He. That is the Yod He Vav He. Now, we would translate this in a couple different ways. Uh, we, the closest translation, uh, well, the problem with this is if you look at the Hebrew here, there's no vowel points. Um, there is a vowel point. There's vowel points, these little little buttons here. You can see little the little T that's underneath the Vav. Uh, those are actually the vowels. The vowels in Hebrew uh, were included later on 
in above and below uh, the text to give a pronunciation guide. Uh, we don't have that in the original texts, but we see it developed in a way that allows for uh, development of uh, pronunciation. So the most common pronunciation of this name for God is uh, Yahweh. Yod -Heh -Vav -Heh. Uh, you would also see it in some English translations as Jehovah. Uh, now that is because the word God in this sense, the Yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, the Tetragrammaton as it's also known, is, um, is a sacred name of God. It's, it's uh, to be revered. And the concept within uh, Judaism and within uh, the early Hebrews uh, was that saying someone's name gave you some power over them. For us to be able to say the name of God, even if it's the name that God has given us to, to name to God, uh, might uh, bring about irreverence, might bring about using God in a way that God would not want to be used. So um, it was developed as a practice to, instead of pronounce God's name as God's name would be pronounced, would be to add the vowel points of Lord, uh, Adonai. So if you put the vowel points of Adonai into the Tetragrammaton, you have something that translates closer to Jehovah. Uh, this is why it is translated this way, the Lord God here. Uh, and we would see, um, let's see. And we would see that in the Hebrew as Yahweh Elohim. Now it is translated Lord there because it has the vowel points for Adonai. Um, what this tells us is that there are two accounts for the creation stories and that they were probably, uh, we, we can look at it uh, through hindsight, uh, to say that they were probably written by different authors. This is something that people started to figure out in the 1600s, uh, because up until that point, up until the Enlightenment, uh, it was really difficult for laity to read and study scripture. Uh, it was very much a, a power hierarchy that didn't allow for uh, non-clergy, uh, the, the, the non-priestly class, uh, to be able to look at this in their own language. In fact, the first guy that tried to translate the Bible into English, William Tyndale, uh, was, was martyred because of uh, because he tried to do that he actually wasn't able to finish it so we are thankful for folks that risked their very lives uh, that risked um, their their social standing their their families for questioning um, and we see that with the beginning of uh, uh, in early enlightenment thinkers that started to take a look at these texts and consider why they might be written the way they might be written and to take a, a critical look at it. We would see uh, that beginning with, um, with Spinoza in the in mid 1600s and continuing even to this day. We see it take a form, in fact, uh, that is developed in part from well, from the creation myths and, and uh, continuing through at least the entirety of the Torah, of the first five, of the Pentateuch, of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So what they started to figure out, and I, let me go back here, because I did say that the creation stories are myth. I hope that doesn't get your hackles up. Uh, let's be careful with our language, but let's use language that uh, denotes what a form or a genre is. So what is a myth? Myth, when you hear this, you might think that it's made up. That's one of the ways that the, that the English word myth is used. But that's not the only way that, that myth can be used. As a literary genre, myth is a, uh, a story, a narrative that tries to explain why things are the way they are now. And you see this in both of the creation myths. Uh, I mean no offense by using this language, but it is, uh, uh, it is linguistically appropriate. These are stories that we find as foundational to us as faith. 
uh, as, as faithful folks. And these two creation stories try to tell us why things are the way they are now by saying they were this way then. Um, we have difficulty in childbirth. We have difficulty um, raising crops and gardening. We have, um, oh, let's see, we, we have uh, the ability to reason. Uh, and well, snakes don't have legs. When we look at all this stuff, well, why is there, why are the stars in the sky? Why is there the sun? And why is there the moon? And why uh, is the sun out without the moon? And why is the moon out opposite to the sun? Uh, why do the stars guide us uh, as, as we travel? All of these things try to be uh, explained through these creation myths. That doesn't mean anything about its historicity. Uh, we need to say that. I know some folks in our congregation uh, read this as an as a absolute uh, historical document. And I know some folks in our congregation read these stories as myth in that sense that they are made up or, or fabricated, but no matter what stance you take on this, it doesn't mean anything more than this is still, um, this is the, the, both of these stories, the entirety of scripture is still authoritative as a document for us. Uh, I talked about that a little bit last week, but it bears repeating that if you read this literally, or if you read this as uh, completely made up as, as humans trying to explain why the world is the way it is through the lens of what God is doing for them. I think everybody across that spectrum would still take scripture as authoritative in some way. So we need to honor that and we need to name that. Um, but uh, so when I use the word myth, I don't mean it as anything more than a literary genre that attempts to explain uh, why the world is the way it is and why it is foundational for us. But there's a lot that we miss in this if we just read it in English. Uh, not only do we miss the in a beginning, the Bereshit, but that's also why we get the name of Genesis for the, the first book of the Bible. And we should say that originally they weren't books, they were scrolls. Um, and you can only fit so much on one scroll, which is why there were five scrolls in the Torah. The first scroll was named after the first word in a beginning. Bereshit, Genesis, in a beginning. And we go through that and we see one creation story that goes up to chapter two that explains in hierarchical order how things were developed from one day to the next day to the next day to the next day. Uh, and the, the author of this story chooses to name God as Elohim, as God. Within the, and, and this is a, a very, um, above and beyond uh, depiction of God. God is outside of creation. God is breathing into creation. And indeed, as God says, uh, or as the wind moves across the face of the deep, uh, that wind, that word for wind is, is uh, ruach. Uh, we see that, let me compare this here, the wind. Spirit of God moved upon the, oh, the spirit. That's why it's actually translated a little bit differently in the KJV. So, and that's why it's important to have these uh, opportunities to look at the different translations where we would see uh, the spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. Uh, we would see um, it developed as that spirit, spirit or wind, ruach. Uh, it gives the depiction in this first creation story that God is literally breathing life, um, that everything that came into being, uh, that God was creating, God spoke it into existence, and it was, and it was good. We see that taken uh, into further development to be, to be fleshed out quite literally uh, in the person of, of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying at all that this is foreshadowing the Christ, uh, but rather that uh, the story of the Christ takes these elements of creation and revisits them in a way that would be familiar to the audience that was receiving them. In the same way we hear the word was with God and the word was God, we recognize that as part of a creation story uh, and we connect it to this story in Genesis. So the first story is very much a story of uh, a omniscient, omnipresent, 
God speaking these things into being. The second is, is a much more uh, relatable, interpersonal God. Uh, and it's not saying that these are in, in contrast to one another or juxtaposition. And it's not saying that they're truly in harmony either. Um, what your position is or what your theology is, is going to say a lot about how you approach these and what you hear from these different stories. Uh, but we see then in the second creation story, it's very much down to earth. There's a lot more dirt. Indeed, we are created from the dirt. Instead of God just saying, let there be people, God forms and fashions people uh, from this garden where all things were grown. Um, but there's also some hints that we can't quite take this as a, a literal historical document. Uh, and that's uh, really made apparent in uh, 10 through, through, I guess it would be 14. Uh, this part where the river flows out of Eden to water the garden and there it divides and becomes four branches. Uh, these rivers aren't really close to each other, nor do they have uh, a central point from which they develop. Uh, more so, it's a, uh, a piece of literature that suggests that all life has come from this, that the four corners of uh, the, the, the hospitable land at the time were from Eden, that this is the point, the source of life, and it's worth knowing this. Uh, we could talk a whole lot about the theology here about what the nature of the garden of uh, the tree of good and evil, the tree of knowledge, um, but we can leave some of that. Um, one thing I do want to touch on is uh, the, the language of man and woman in this story in the second chapter. Um, where would we be here? So uh, when God is when God is creating man. Um, and, and that would be. There we go. Uh, verse seven, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Uh, we miss in the English the connection between the ground and man as it's translated. Um, and indeed, every version here uses man. But Oh, and you, you, you do see how some of them change. This, uh, the, here we have uh, Jehovah God or Lord God. But um, the word for man is different than what is used uh, when man and woman are apparent and present together. The word used for man is Adam. Uh, that's where we get the first guy's name, right? And I say a guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm beholden to the tradition as well. Um, the word for man, the word for earth creature is probably more appropriate, uh, is Adam. That's where we get the name Adam for the first human being. Adam comes from the dust of the ground. Ground is Adama. So we really have this beautiful play on words in the Hebrew that from the dust of the ground, from the ground comes this creature. Uh, from ground comes earth creature. So from Adama comes Adam. It's really clever. And it doesn't change uh, until later on, until uh, the woman is brought into the picture. And we can see, as, if we compare with the Hebrew as well, um, woman is Isha. And while they're still using the word Adam for the first man, uh, woman is Isha, the name for man as as man and woman as a, a, a dual a dual nature um, is Ish. So man is Ish, woman is Isha, and you see the connection between the two. And that is where you start to see, let's find this here. Excuse me for going back and forth here. Ish, there you go. So therefore, a man shall leave his father, his mother, and shall uh, hold fast to his wife. So Ish and Isha. And that's where we start to see the change between the first creature of the ground being less connected here to the, to the earth and more connected in relationship to the rest of family. So uh, from the ground 
comes earth creature. From Adam, from Adama comes Adam. And yet, as we talk about relationships, uh, all of a sudden we have from man, Ish, connects to woman, Isha. These are stories that tell us something about the nature of humanity, about the nature of God, and why the world is the way it is. They are myth in the sense that they give us uh, direction for why things are the way they are. It's the world explained through this creation story, through two creation stories that tell a little bit of a different story from each one. So uh, in the 1600s, people started to recognize this. In the beginning of the Enlightenment, um, the gifts of reason were used to uh, deliberate and to be critical. And when I say be critical, I don't mean to um, criticize it in that it's tearing it apart, but to be critical in, in evaluation, to look at it with eyes that are outside of tradition or what had been taught previously, to, to try and look at it in a fresh way to understand something that might not have been apparent before. So even though Spinoza kind of began this process in the 1600s, we see it begin to be developed into this concept uh, of what was known as the, uh, well, it was, it's called a couple of different things. It, it was known as uh, higher criticism, uh, which is not quite used as much anymore. Um, probably the way we would name it today is uh, the historical critical method, historical criticism. It's a way to look at scripture that allows us to exegete, uh, to take from the text, to know from the text uh, what they were trying, the author was trying to say to the original audience. This exegesis allows us to sidestep our own lenses, the way through which we see scripture because we've been brought up and immersed with it, taught about it since we were little kids. We have this whole structure in our own faith lives that has been developed by every Sunday school teacher and every minister we've heard, every sermon that we've heard uh, in person or online or on the radio. All of these things develop our worldview. Uh, all of our experiences, uh, our upbringing, where we were born, all of these things develop our worldview. It's the lens through which we see the world. Exegesis is an opportunity to acknowledge that and to read scripture with a fresh lens, uh, or at least to acknowledge our lens in such a way that we can, um, we can approach scripture in a way that we might hear something new, different, uh, and perhaps even original to what the author was, was trying to write to the audience. So this developed in a way uh, that has been known as uh, documentary hypothesis. This is a concept that the Torah, the, the uh, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, were written by four authors, um, the, the Yahwist, the Elohist, the Deuteronomist, and the priestly sources. This has had, um, different levels of following throughout its development and its uh, development as a hypothesis. Uh, the, the thought is that the Yahwist might have been the earliest. And you see uh, in the second chapter, when we have Lord God as the name of God, indeed that word, that's the way that the Yahwist or that group always refers to God, Lord God. Uh, Yahweh Elohim, uh, amongst other ways of using that tetragrammaton, that name of God, uh, while well as the first chapter, in a different way, names God as solely as Elohim, as God. So the thought became that these must be two different authors. And the original thought was that uh, they tried to lay it out, these uh, theologians, that all of this was written uh, and compiled before the Babylonian exile, um, before Jerusalem fell uh, to Babylon. Then they started to develop it further and revisionist theologians began to think that really probably all this existed as oral tradition up until the Babylonian exile when folks figured they needed to start writing it down or these, these stories would be lost. Um, 
the thought is during the Babylonian exile, right before and during and right after, uh, that these the stories that we have in the Torah really began to condense and, and to be codified into written form. Up until that point, perhaps they were they were oral tradition. They were told around campfires. They were told uh, around dinner tables as ways to remember identity, as ways to, to celebrate who they were uh, as followers of, of Yahweh, of followers of God. What we have then developed, uh, it, it came to a point where every single line was attributed to one of these authors, um, trying to figure out who wrote what and why it came to be edited and put together this way. Um, and it has since been set, by, set back a little bit to look at the overarching narrative structure as a whole to see the uniformity uh, of it within these uh, the, within higher criticism, within historical critical method. Uh, but there is some revisiting of this, uh, of this uh, documentary hypothesis uh, and a revisiting of source criticism in general. And this source criticism is one form of the exegetical method that allows us to take a look at the source material and to figure out what the author was trying to say to the audience. Uh, we see that in developed, we see source criticism developed into documentary hypothesis and its other forms. Now, I know what I'm saying here might be a little offensive if you take a very literal approach to scripture. I think that we should try and find harmony in this. Uh, no matter where you fall on the spectrum of biblical authority, all of us that approach scripture from authoritative perspective do have an authority that we adhere to in scripture. Uh, from folks that believe it literally as a historical document that it all happened that way, to folks that just see it as humans writing about God. Uh, if, you are if you are a follower of Christ, if you are part of the faithful tradition and community, then you see these stories as foundational to you, as authoritative to you, and you see something about the nature of God revealed through these things. If you take this as myth, as completely made up, you still see something about the nature of God revealed in these stories. And I think that that's the consensus that we need to find as we, uh, as we study together that we can come, especially as disciples, as disciples of Christ, we are non-credal. There is nothing that we say that you need to believe to be a part of us other than a belief in Christ, a following of Christ as, um, as authoritative for your life, as, as a, the, a bringer of salvation or atonement or redemption or whatever language we want to use uh, when we talk about atonement models, uh, which is something we can talk about another day. But we need to finish here naming that the Bible, no matter how we approach it, is an authoritative document. It is scripture to us in that it tells us something about the nature of God and how humans have approached the divine for millennia. And in hearing these stories and reading them again, in studying them, or in taking them uh, as a meditative tool, they still tell us something about how God is talking to us today. So in these stories, I invite you to read them. I invite you to read them again and to uh, look at what I've been saying here in this session and, and to consider what you like and what you don't like, uh, but more importantly, to hear God speaking. So if you hear something, if something about the nature of God is revealed to you here, please comment or let me know uh, so that we can continue looking at this in a way uh, that is helpful for the group and helpful, helpful for uh, our own faith development. Certainly that is my goal here, uh, that we might together be able to make and develop mature disciples, disciples that follow the Christ, the son of the living God. So I hope that this was informative and, and perhaps not too offensive for you, but if you were offended or if you found something very uh, helpful, please let me know in the comments and uh, please, please talk to me on a Sunday or give me a call in the office anytime. That being said, let us go in peace. See y'all later.